This is a recording of papers given at the conference on the 7th of November, 1981, organized by the Scottish Georgian Society and the Department of Extramural Studies of the University of Edinburgh, with the support of the Scottish Church's Architectural Heritage Trust. I might say that I am an Episcopalian minister and I'm going to be talking about exclusively Presbyterian churches. <laughs> Some of you may have heard of a historian called M. E. M. Donaldson. She was an Episcopalian, perhaps with a vengeance. She remarked in one of her books that there were three groups of people she didn't choose to meet. And they were Campbells, Socialists, and non-Episcopalians. <laughs> and she wrote, amongst other books, two very interesting books about Argyle, that some of you may know, called Wanderings in Argyle, and Further Wanderings in Argyle. <laughs> and she talks a lot about the Appin part of the world, where, as you will know, there are lots of Episcopalians. And though most of her research is good, at Dura, she says that the Episcopalians are so strong there that they refer to the Church of Scotland as the parliamentary church because it is the parliamentary religion, the Presbyterian religion. Of course, she got it wrong because the church there is a government parliamentary church built soon after 1824 under the Act of Parliament, churches that were perhaps, as I will show later, not designed by Telford. Now, this is a parliamentary church. This is the one at Poolieu. I am sure that some of you have seen parliamentary churches as you have traveled in the Highlands. The one in Iona is perhaps the best well known. Here is the original map of where they were built, and you will see that it stretches from Shetland in the north to Isla in the south. And if you can see carefully, you will see that some have red spots. Those were churches and manses, and a few have blue spots, and they were manses only. 32 churches and 42 manses were built. They were built in the late 1820s following two Acts of Parliament, 1824, which was a mistake, as I will explain later, and the revised version in 1825. This is Anapur, a fishery town, as you know. There was another one built at Tobermory, and perhaps that is a sign of why they needed to be built, changes in population in the Highlands, but that was not the only reason. All that the Highland parishes were particularly large, because in a way, the Church of Scotland had sorted out their way of ministering in the Highlands, because they had missionaries who went around from place to place. But following on Dr. Cowan's talk, lying behind the building of the parliamentary churches, there was an ecclesiastical and parliamentary motive. It was a way of placating the evangelicals who were demanding more churches that they should be built, although in the event they weren't happy about it because the moderates seemed to get into each of the parishes whereas the moderates weren't happy about it because it seemed to be pandering to the evangelicals. The Act gave £50,000 to build the churches, originally for 30 churches and 10 manse only. And they appointed the commissioners of Highland Roads and Bridges to be the people to build them and arrange, or at least to arrange for the construction. And how did they choose these sites? The heritors had to apply, and this was where the mistake was made at the beginning. In the first act, it laid down that two heritors in each parish 
of value over 100 pounds Scots had to apply to the commission for the church to be built and they had to give a grant of land for the church site, the manse site, and for a glebe. But of course, in the great large highland parishes, quite often there was only one heritor. And so the most needful places were unable to have a church under the first act. And so it was amended and only one heritor had to apply. Ninety parishes applied, some were ruled out, as being out with the terms of the Act. For instance, there was an application from Perth. There was also an application for a new church at Amory, which already had one that seated 900 people. <laughs> now, who designed these churches? Was it Telford or was it some other person? Unfortunately, all the minutes that relate to the building of these parliamentary churches have gone missing. And so one has to add two and two together from the surviving records of the heritors, the people that applied, and one or two other accounts um, and records of expenses that survive. Telford's name has certainly been given to them. But when one studies it more carefully, one realizes that probably all he did was to sign the bottom of some plans and amend them slightly. Now these seem to be the original plans. Three different people were asked to submit plans, three different surveyors who worked for the Highland Roads and Bridges. Mitchell, Smith, and Thompson. And these plans seem to have been drawn up by someone called James Smith. Not the famous James Smith, uh, but a rather insignificant architect, perhaps, based at Inverness. He's known to have designed some lighthouses. And those of you who are members of the Scottish Georgian Society will know that he designed Ross Keane Church, 1828, about which there has been quite a bit of controversy recently. And in the last annual report, John Gifford has made more inquiries into who and what James Smith designed and who he was. Now, these are the original plans, we think, that Telford then adapted. And you will see at the top the church, not too dissimilar from that that was built. But if you can look carefully, you will see that there's an outside staircase to a gallery. It shows very faintly at the top of the left top left plan and against the wall of the church to the right of it. Also the windows in the side elevation at the top right were changed. These seem to be the plans as they were finished. These are plans of the kirk at Stour, which is near Loch Inver. You will see the traditional pulpit here. Here's one door in, and here is the other door, a window there, and there, and four others. Here is the pulpit, here is the eldest pew, this they sometimes call the manse pew, and the seats circle round. And this here is the communion table, with the seats alongside it on both sides, so that they could sit um, at the communion table during that service. It's a particularly conservative plan that was drawn up. It is the traditional T-shaped plan that Colin McWilliam mentioned, and it was capable of extension or being reduced. It could be reduced by leaving this aisle off completely and building the wall across there. It was capable of holding more people by having galleries built over these three parts of the church. That the heritors had to pay for, the commissioners just built the plain church itself. Now the pulpit was the prominent feature in the interior, and here is the interior of Stour Kirk as it was originally built, 1971. And here is the pulpit, there's the presenter's stall, 
there's the minister's Bible. Here is the sounding board. It doesn't show up very well on an elevation like that. And there is his light to light the book when it was dark outside. And a very small element of Gothic detail inside the two the tops of the boards behind the pulpit underneath the sounding board. The christening bowl was attached to the corner of the front there. This is unfortunately what had happened to Stoa in 1958 as a result of a visit of a team called the Highland Churches Team who set about restoring and putting in order some Highland churches. The sounding board was gone. They fitted in a hardboard board there. Um, they painted the walls. That's the major um, alteration on the inside. What it would have looked like is much more like this, which is the church at Croyke up on the east coast near Bonner Bridge. And here is the sounding board. But this church didn't have room for galleries, and so the windows are lower, and it isn't altogether um, a fair comparison with what store would have been like. That church you may know because it's on the window of that church that the people who had been cleared from the nearby glens um, wrote their names on the window. And for that reason, I think that church has survived intact. Here is the communion table at Stoa, around which the um, elders and communicants sat. It's a long table, and it has a flap in the middle so that people could get in to this side of the pew uh, without squeezing all the way down either side. And here's the rest of the seating at Stoa. Here's the communion table again. This view is taken either from the pulpit or from the windowsill, I think. And there's the flap again. Here's the little door that they got into the church, into the communion pew with and the um, hard board pews all round, no galleries here, whatever built. It was capable of seating 300 people if they didn't have the galleries, 500 people if they did have the galleries. There was no heating provided, whatever, in any of the churches. There was no ventilation either. The lighting here is later. There was no lighting included. So it depended a great deal on whether galleries had been built in each church as to how light it would have been because the galleries went across the middle of those windows and they made the downstairs extremely dark. Now what sort of building surrounded this meeting house, the 32 meeting houses that were built in the highlands and islands? And how did the Highland Roads and Bridges Commissioners arrange to build them? Now, with the minutes, all the original plans and specifications have gone missing. We know, though, from surviving records, a certain amount of what was laid down, and the timber to be included was Rothy Marcus Speyside timber. Iron nails were to be used in the roof. And when various people applied to use different timber or copper nails, the commissioners refused. And here is the front of a parliamentary church, one that would hold a gallery. There's the inside, um, sideways. This is 1971 at Stora again. And here is the church at Aharako in Ardnamurkin. It was, it's built on land that was given by Sir James Riddle of Ardnamurkin and Sunart. William Thompson of the Crinan Canal uh, was both the surveyor for the board for this site and the contractor who built the church here at Aharako, and it cost £1,478, 12 and 7 pence, and that included the manse as well. We know that the way, the method of payment to people who built the churches, £100 when the foundations were laid, £200 when they had got up to the window sills, 
Uh, 300 pounds when the walls were leveled, the top, 300 pounds when the buildings were roofed, that's in the spade timber, etc., and 300 pounds when the buildings were finished, except for harming the manse, which was added and done later, and then the balance was paid when the work had been finally inspected and approved of. In this case, in March 1829, by Joseph Mitchell, who was the principal inspector based at Inverness. And in that year, 1829, we know that he covered 2,630 and a half miles in his tour of inspection, and he got paid eight pence a mile. <coughs> now, the churches have different exteriors depending on whether they have those galleries or not. This is the church at Kinloch Leichert on the road between um, Dingwall and Strathpether and Loch Carron and Poole There were no galleries built here. It has a lower roof and it's not dissimilar from the church on Iona. This picture is out of focus. It is of Ardgower. I'm not sure whether it was the rain or the thought of all the Maclean's who live at Ardgower that made me shake the camera when I took it. But Ardgower is an unusual church, unique amongst the parliamentary churches, because the minister lived at the new manse with his new church at North Balahulish, and they also built this small church at Ardgawa on the other side of the Coran Narrows, um, and he went over to take the services there, living at Balahulish. So there were a small number of Maclean's, no doubt, at Ardgawa. They didn't need a large church. They certainly didn't need a T-shaped one, but they provided the minister with a vestry or changing room, which is fair. In fact, I think that's one of the earliest records of a vestry or changing room being provided for Presbyterian Church. <coughs> I suppose that it's the windows that make these churches particularly distinctive, and they are very distinctive. It's the Gothic elements, really the only Gothic element in the design of the church, and in a way is its relieving feature. Otherwise, they would be particularly uninteresting and boring buildings, I think. Very plain design. The casements were bought from a firm called James Abernethy in Aberdeen. They cost 70 pounds for the six casements well, he's for the six windows, and that excluded the glass that was fitted in them or the freight. And the freight involved moving them from Aberdeen, and in most cases they were sent by Leith and Glasgow. The window, there was no arrangement for the windows to open at all. Notice also the doors, the Gothic semi-Gothic arch above them. This is Alapool, and at Alapool, one can see in the paintwork that there was a pattern above the door in the lintel to match the casements here. Whether that had, was also in other churches, we don't know. This church is Dura, M. E. M. Donaldson's favorite church, no doubt. And I want you to notice the belfry at the top. The belfry could be at either end of the church. It didn't matter at all. The bells, which were part of the original costing, it's rather strange, I think, that they should include a bell, but not an opening window, seven pounds, that, and they were dis uh, made by James Milne of Edinburgh. Now, what has happened to these churches since their completion about the year 1828, 29, 1830. This is the church at Stour, north of Loch Inver, whose plans you saw earlier on. We know that from the very start, they needed repointing and re from about the period 1834. 
as the commission was wound up in 1835, it would then be a matter of looking in Kirk session records to see how they survived. More important, however, was the disruption. Because in the Highlands, so many people went over to the pre-church, and in nearly every case, in a place where there was a parliamentary church. If a congregation survived and filled the church, as at Tobermory or Loch Gilpead, for instance, it's not surprising that the churches, which are rather meager in some ways, certainly not very comfortable, in those two places they were demolished and finer and better churches were built to replace them. The manse, in every case virtually, survived. The churches were what were unfashionable. If they were little used, then they survived until the time of this century's reunions. And then, if there was a reunion in a parish, between the parish established church and the free church, the free church was generally the more comfortable, and so it was the one that survived. And the parliamentary church was the one that was abandoned. This, as I say, is the church at Stour in Sutherland, restored, or sort of restored, in 1958 by the Highland Church's team. It included removing the belfry and with the pieces making that cross, and it was demolished three years ago. Some were altered in the century. This is the back of the church at Aharaku that I mentioned to you, and you will see that the a church that was originally T plan, like the plan that you saw, has been reduced in size because the numbers of people attending the church were so few, and there would have been an aisle out here at the side, that's maybe part of it, but I don't think it is. There's a break in the wall just beyond that pipe, and they reused the windows that would have been at the side in the long wall, like that. Many churches were refitted. The liturgical requirements of the Church of Scotland altered as the century progressed. This is our gala from the front. I didn't shake the camera quite so much here. And you will notice that behind this tree and that one, the two doors have been blocked up and a door has been built at the end. And to any of you who explore churches, you will know that that is a sure sign that inside there has been liturgical rearrangement. This is the inside of the church at a Aharaku. The pulpit, which would have been there at the far side of the photograph, has gone. And a new pulpit has been built here. The old, long, thin table has disappeared and a small communion table has been put there in a sort of quasi-chancel, a raised end of the church. This is the church at Plockton. This has also recently been rearranged and done up after a fashion. The long table has been removed about 12 years ago small table has been put in its place. And what has happened to the belfry? Well, they've blocked up the sides of it so that the sound just comes out at one end. And I leave you to think about the snow sun in comparison with the old harling or the stone facade of some of the other churches that I've shown you. Back to Annapool again. This church was abandoned 12 years ago. The Episcopalians hoped to buy it, but they were given a prohibitive price, and so they've now built their own church, and this church is completely unused, though it does have one of those little blue notices outside telling one that what an important church um, it is architecturally. The church at Poole that I showed you first of all has been abandoned this year. And this is Strontian. And what has happened here, if you can work it out, 
is that the church has been demolished from there right down to about there. They've rebuilt the sides of those windows. They fitted in a new top to them. They fitted the door from there as an outside door there. And it doesn't bear much relationship.